Right. So, we're starting to record, which means we can begin our cupping event. Welcome, everybody, to the um, Acid Edition Cupping. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun as we go through four coffees and explore what four types of acidity bring to these coffees. It's going to be a lot of quick sipping, um, but we just go through our, go through the quick instructions on what it means to do a cupping. This is for YouTube people who aren't familiar with it. You're basically going to get around 12 grams of coffee. You can do 10, 8 grams, it doesn't really matter. Just grind them all the same. We usually grind medium fine. That allows for uh, a really good extraction. You're not going to use any paper or anything like that. You're just going to pour water, wait, then use spoons to scoop out the grounds, and then wait more, about 10 minutes of steep time, and then that's it. You start sipping, and you score the uh, acidity, mouthfeel, uh, the finish, all sorts of things like that. And by doing that, you improve your ability to taste coffee and enjoy coffee in the future. This is why we do it. It's sort of mental agility for your taste buds. Okay, so acid addition, here we go. Let's get grinding straight away. So we're gonna do the four coffees and grind them the same way. I'll grab coffee number one and put it in my ode. So get your hand grinders or your machine grinders going. Good to hear. Um, Nucket, could you unlock your phone so that it rotates the right way? Excellent. Okay, coffee number one I'm going to be grinding up is La Crucitas. So go, remember, as soon as the coffee is ground, take in the dry aroma. The moment the coffee is freshly ground, it's releasing the most amount of aroma in the dry state. So you really want to take in what the dry aroma is like and try and remember that because then when you uh, taste the coffee, you'll connect with how it smelt when it was dry and you'll, you'll be able to analyze is the taste very different to the dry aroma or very similar? These sort of things matter. Okay. Grinding coffee number one in the ode, which says for cupping is between two and three. So that's the medium fine setting. I'll go closer to two because the finer you go, the more flavor you'll extract. Wow, terrific dry aroma. Now I'm using our right roast cupping bowls. So if you're ever interested in a really good cupping experience at the right roast every month, I recommend these cupping bowls. They've got the four colors on them, blue, red, yellow, and green. And it means you'll never get which coffees you're using confused. See, now I've poured number one into the blue one. I'll always know that's number one. Okay. Now coffee number two which is the mock. This one represents the citric acidity. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's a delightful coffee. And uh, yeah, I really, really enjoyed talking with mock and learning a lot more about this coffee and a brilliant recipe they gave us for brewing it. So after this session today, do jump on our IGTV and follow the roasters recipes. They each gave us a really, really great recipe for these coffees. Natalie's number three, let's see. Oh, this would be the um, abstract. Yeah, a really, really amazing surprise because I haven't had a Honduras like this in a long time. I find Honduras coffees, when they're as delightful as this, to have the most deep, deep, complex flavors. Okay, that's number two. Grinding up number three. Just want to make sure there's no grounds left over from the previous coffee. We want no cross-contamination cross with flavors. So make sure your grinder is empty of as much of the previous coffee as possible. Top tip. I've seen professionals do this. Before they grind a coffee, uh, if they're worried about any leftover granules or gra uh, grounds of coffee from the previous coffee, just stick three or four beans in of the coffee you're about to grind, grind them up, then put the full amount of the coffee you're going to grind, but they already ground up a few beans and sort of cleaned up the, the, the grinder with the next coffee. It's an unusual thing to do, but I've seen people do it. Look at his showing. Ah, knock it. 
Is that for cleaning cameras? I really want one of them. Oh, actually, I know that's by Al Keng something, isn't it? It's the guy in, uh, in Asia who makes these special equipment for coffee. Yeah, I love that guy. He's got really cool tools. Uh, EV presser comes with one in the bag. Really? Yeah. Wow. I need one of them. <laughs> okay, I just use brushes. I've got a lot of brushes. So, if you'll see, guys, there's my tools of cleaning. I've got a big brush. Uh, this little one is really great for getting inside the grinder. And this tiny little one, this one officially came with the ode. Not a very impressive brush, but still. Okay. <laughs> and Natalie even has one to clean her radiator. <laughs> okay. So that's coffee number four, the red bowl. Okay. Start heating up your kettles if you haven't already. Mmm, wow. Solberg and Hansen. There's something about the aroma, the taste, the everything. Just, there we go. Solberg and Hansen dry aroma. Oh, it's terrific, isn't it? Beautiful. Okay, let's get pouring. So my kettle's ready. Is everyone ready? Okay, so acid addition, just to tell you in general, is a terrific experience because we have chosen four different types of acidity for these coffees. What we have here is a Honduras. Um, what process is this one? Let's have a look. Coffee number one. Honey anaerobic. Honey anaerobic. And this one is representing um, malic acid. Now, the word malum is actually a Latin word for apple tree. So malic acid should suggest to you that there's a lot of kind of apple-like acidity in there. And I learned from eating different types of acids in my acid challenge that uh, the pH of apple, roughly something about 5, 4.5, no, 3.9, I'm sorry, 3.9. So we're talking about at the upper end of 3. And then when you get to the low end of 3, you start to get really juicy stuff like lemons and oranges. So apple acidity is very acidic, but it's not the most acidic. Um, Number two, mock, the citric acid. Now you would think this one has a real punch of acidity, but it doesn't. It's a gentle acidity. It's just of the citric variety. And then number three, this one is the acetic acid, a very interesting acid that's produced during the actual processing of the coffee rather than at the tree stage or the growth stage or the soil. You have actual acidity being produced while the coffee is sitting in big piles um, and then finally, coffee number four is a washed coffee, and it's a Colombia, and this one represents... Asorbic. I always forget Asorbic. that. Asorbic acid, which is a lovely kind of... Um, well, it's very similar to citric acid, uh, uh, but it's not the same. Uh, it provides often deep umami flavors as well, and sweetnesses. Well, this coffee is unbelievable. Um, so we'll go through them, but first we have to get brewing. So let's get our kettles ready. Um, I think Ryan's still... Ryan's still grinding, so we've got to wait. We do this at the same time. It's all about timing. So um, if you at home are watching and are about to pour, just skip through to when I actually start pouring. But here we have to wait for everybody. Did you guys see, by the way, a talk that we had with coffee scientist Samo Smirk? This sort of kicked off the month of Acid Edition. If you go to our YouTube channel, Natalie, and all of you, you will be able to see this video. And it's, it's a fascinating conversation because he's doing specifically science studies of coffee. So there's no better person than Samo to tell us about not just acids in coffee, but the whole trippy nature of flavors and acidity I learned is actually a bit of a kind of optical illusion in coffee. You may taste citric acid, but it isn't citric acid, or you may taste all these different acids, but they're not really there. They're just presenting themselves perceptively as those types of acids. And it's really wacky that coffee does that because it isn't actually citric acid that you're tasting. Just like any of those flavors of melon, guava, caramel, or any of the flavors that you're tasting in coffee, they're not embedded in the bean. 
It's just that the coffee bean is this magical, magical fruit that produces flavors, acidities, mouthfeels, and there's so many varieties. Now we're going to get to the root of four of them, and they're quite sort of broad. And another important thing to remember, guys, is that this isn't just one type of acidity. When you taste an acidity, it usually means that it could be a bunch of them that are creating that sensation. We're today just breaking things down on a perceptive, basic level. And from there, you can then move forward to more advanced experiences. Okay. Now, get dry aroma? Uh, yes, could I have a tasting card, please? So grab your tasting cards, everyone, and a pen mm -hmm. as we begin our little kind of sensory uh, exercise. So at first you might wonder, why am I putting all these marks on a piece of paper? How's that gonna help me enjoy coffee in the future? Well, it does. When you commit to paper, what you go through today, you will actually be able to reflect and your taste buds will be able to move forward and appreciate things a little bit better. Okay, so write down on your tasting cards as well, the month and the edition, because then when you photo it and send it through to the Coffee Club Lounge or to us, on Instagram, we'll know who you are, what the edition was as well. Okay, so I put my name, Tim, edition, well, ignore edition number, just name, acid, and today's date, third five, 22. Okay, coffee number one, no, here we go. Sorry, what am I doing now? Dry aroma, I'm sorry, I'm so confused. Okay, dry aroma, here we go. <laughs> number one. Very, very, very gentle, number one. A surprise. Okay, I'm wrong. Number two is even more gentle. Now, you see, this is why you do cuppings. Because if you were to just taste one coffee or smell one coffee, it exists almost in a vacuum. I smelled number one, and I said it was quite mild. But as soon as I smelled number two, I smelled something even milder. And that put into context number one. So the more of them I'm drinking or tasting or smelling, the more context I'm creating between each of them. So the speed at which you smell, the speed at which you brew, uh, taste the coffees, that's as important as just analyzing one on its own. Okay, number three. Pungent, huh? Really leaps out of the cup. There's that acetic acid in action. Number three is probably the only coffee where I'm actually smelling in the dry aroma, the acid, right? Are you guys getting that as well? You're sort of actually picking up the acidity in the dry aroma. So something for you to note is that number three, it's a carbonic macerated coffee and uh, it's produced acetic acid. And that's the type that you can smell early in the dry aroma. There's probably other acidities that you can smell in dry aroma as well, but this one, I'm now not gonna note in my mind, uh, carbonic maceration and pungent smells is the acetic acid. Right, amazing. So let's get brewing because I've now understand the dry aroma, but I'm not gonna mark down aroma as the final. The wet aroma also matters. Okay, kettle in hand. Are we all ready? Everybody ready to start the timer? Iko will start the timer. And off we go. So just fill each bowl. And if you feel like you haven't got much water left, stop, refill before you put another bowl in. You don't want half a cup of water. And if you have cupping bowls, just go nearly to the top. No scales needed. If you're using four different shaped bowls, just make sure you pour the same amount in each. That's probably where scales might help. Okay. That's two, now three. I'm gonna make sure I get all the grounds wet as well. Sometimes you can just pour the coffee in and all the, there's a lot of dry grounds that would sit on top. That's probably not a good idea. Okay, number four now. And there we go. That's it. Tempted as I am to fiddle or add top up water anywhere, I won't. I'll just leave it. This is a basic brew. So don't think about this as, as like when you brew a coffee and you follow a recipe. 
that's the point at which you really want to concentrate on how you pour, how many times you pour, pre-infusions. This time with a cupping, it's really just to kind of blunt, pour, wait, then scoop out, then taste. It's about speed to get to the point where you're tasting. Uh, and in public cuppings, you can have four, eight, 10, 12 cups of coffee. So the practicalities become clear about cupping where you just don't want to waste time brewing individual coffees. Speed and hard work is what cuppings are about, not sort of savoring one cup, gently brewing, that kind of thing. You're in work mode now, but in a good way. Let's look a bit more at uh, Samo Smirk's coffee acidity perception. Maybe can you bring it up as something we can look on the screen? Have we got an image of it? I want to share this. Ico might be able to find it, but if you guys got your leaflet, grab your leaflet. No, sorry, go back, go back. Can't because we're recording that screen. Don't worry. Um, so uh, yeah, get your leaflet. I wanted to bring it up on the screen, but I won't be able to because we're recording the screen. Um, this was designed, now just so you know, Pull and Pour is responsible for the sort of graphic look of it, the design, but he is not the one that actually came up with this idea. Samo himself didn't even have this chart until we approached him and asked him for the acidity perception thing. So it took him a while. He was actually fiddling around with it. Um, I could probably show you early drafts, but it's on my phone. Um, they're quite interesting because he wasn't sure at first about like the astringent one. He thought it would just be only on the high. But it turns out that astringent can come in at some other slightly lower um, titratable acidities. But the balanced part between 5 and 5.2, this is something interesting. And... I don't know exactly how that reflects on coffee that I brew, but I always like to understand at what point am I, you know, what do the numbers mean when I enjoy something? So when I know I'm enjoying balanced, now I can see thanks to this chart, that means I'm enjoying something between five, 5.2 pH. So coffee itself, just so you understand, good coffee is pH five. And it, is, it doesn't really vary from there. But the acids that we talk about, like, um, citric acidity, that's 3.9. So when you taste citric acid and it really tastes citric, that doesn't mean your coffee is now at 3.9 pH. It's just a kind of illusion. Fascinating thing, really, because the coffee is remaining at five. Great. Okay, spoon's ready. It's time to break the crust. So you grab your spoon, you push or you scoop, but you're basically going to immediately release a lot of aroma. This is your chance to really... Note down the difference between each coffee in the aroma stage. Here we go. Coffee number one. Break the crust. Make sure all the coffee grinds fall to the bottom. Stir around. Wow, sweeter aroma than I imagined. I mean, remember number one and number three are both Honduras coffees. So if you want, quickly smell number one and number three just to see how different two coffees from the same origin are when you do different processes and of course they come from different farms probably different varieties as well okay. very gentle wow i'll mark that down and break the crust on number two so sweet right number two i'd say the aroma it's probably a little bit stronger than number one. Just a bit. And that's surprising because when I smelt the dry aroma, do you remember? Number one was actually stronger. So it swapped. Yeah, they, they, yep. flipped, they? they flipped. Well remembered. Okay. Number three. Right. Well, it's actually a bit milder than when it was a dry aroma, number three. Slightly. That's a bit interesting. The dry aroma was stronger. And finally, number four. Well, I could just sit here and smell number four all day. It's just so warm and inviting and complex. It's got so much umami, right? 
Number four, like a almost beef broth. And I mean that in a good way. No beefiness, honestly. Just some kind of, right, meatiness in a, in a sweet meat, in a nice way. I always thought it was weird to describe coffee as meaty. <laughs> yeah. Very true. I think umami sweetnesses and uh, meaty tobacco, this area of flavors is a complicated one to convey to people in a positive way. Because if somebody is a non-smoker, they'll Im immediately associate tobacco, sweet tobacco as a negative thing. But it really isn't. And uh, yeah, I guess our job is to try and find a good word for meaty, brothy, and uh, umami. Umami is a good one, I think. I, I don't even eat beef, so it's, it's even more peculiar. Ah, <laughs> is this another vegan in Israel? The most amount of vegans you'll find in the world is in Israel. Not, not 100% vegan. I, I do eat chicken, but right. um, yes, it, it is true. <laughs> Great. Oh, let's remove the crust. Right, time to remove the crust from the surface. Get your two spoons. If this is an above view of my cup, then I'm going to get the spoons and put them back to back, go around the edge to the, until the, they meet, and then scoop that out, do it again, take all the bits out, dip the spoons clean twice, then go again, each bowl. Here we go. Perfect. Just going to remove all the scum. Just leave a nice, froth-free, clean black surface without taking out the coffee, of course. Okay, and that is basically the final stage of preparation. After that, you just wait, probably another six minutes or so, and then we'll drink, sip, and analyze. There we go. Mine are done. So I'll put my two spoons here and also have a cup of water ready. Hopefully you haven't eaten too much today. We don't want any external uh, tastes influencing us right now. We want to kind of be as neutral as possible as we dive in. So I know now I'm not tasting anything and I'll keep sipping a little bit of water. I don't want to get thirsty as well because we are waiting. So being a bit thirsty, isn't a great state to taste coffee in, I think, because you might, I'm not sure, you're just, you're not in a good state of mind and maybe there's something scientific about being thirsty on your mouth. Maybe it's not ready to receive taste as well. So stay hydrated, stay neutral, like Switzerland. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Nuckets ready, Ryan's ready, Natalie's ready. Okay, so how many minutes do we have left? Minutes. Cool. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about some interesting facts I learned. Um, if you look at your cards, you'll see, look at citric acids molecules, and then look at the asorb, is it ascorbic acid? Yep. Ascorbic acids molecules, because they are basically exactly the same. It's just that with citric acid, it's the other way around. And also what I learned was that that's uh, lemon and orange. Uh, lemon and orange, sorry. Lemon and orange have the same molecules. So that molecules you see in citric acid, if that was to be the lemon molecules, the orange molecules would be the other way around. So it would be exactly the same as that, but flipped. So when you taste orange, you're tasting the molecules the same as lemons, but just a reverse, which I find interesting that that's what, why it produces a different taste, orange to lemon, because it's both the same um, citric molecules, just in a different formation. Um, it's part of that weird illusionary thing about taste again that I find interesting. Um, Asorbic and citric is just one molecule away. That was it. So sorbic and citric, one molecule away, very, very similar. So um, what? Uh, what's the other molecule one? Malic. It's, malic actually looks like it's very similar to asorbic. 
but it's not. Obviously, there's one HO missing. So I think that these, it's just about when you add one molecule, it's probably that um, sulfuric acid, the most dangerous acid of all that burns through stuff, that's probably just one molecule away from lemon juice. Who knows? <laughs> um, right, I want to, how long have we got left? Two minutes left, right. So in two minutes, we're gonna taste coffee number one, coffee number two, coffee number three, coffee number four, in very quick order. So I want you to know that every month, I always say, we've got to taste through these quickly, but I end up slowing down on either coffee number one or number two, something like that. So we must remind ourselves to keep hurrying through, because I want to go through um, a mouthfeel, acidity, body and finish, let's say in under, under six minutes. Because after that, the temperature is really starting to go down and we'll lose that rhythm in grabbing, identifying flavor notes, uh, getting to the finish. Every time I reach the point where I'm analyzing the finish, the coffees are already a bit too cold. So speed of sipping, speed of sipping. I'll keep reminding myself as well. Pen in hand, reflect on things and maybe don't write down anything until you've tasted all four because I sometimes I sip and I think it's strong and then I sip the next one, but it's not strong. So the comparative analysis, I'm trying things different this month. I just think I'm going to sip quicker and I'm going to wait until I write down until I've had all four in a row and then mouthfeel, then sip all four in a row again, do acidity. Just a new approach for me this month so that I don't end up lingering too long on one coffee. Exercise, exercise. How long we got? Enough, so we can start. All right, let's start sipping. Here we go. Coffee number one. And remember, some of you, there's, you see at professional cuppings, people walking around with a cup. That means they're not really going to drink the coffee, like a wine tasting. They don't want to consume too much. I myself haven't had much coffee today, so I'm going to drink it rather than spit it out. But feel free to have a cup and spit the coffee out if you're concerned about drinking too much. Okay, here we go. All right, I'm tempted to write down, but I won't yet. That was number one. So tart. Can you get the Malik? And straight away, I see the Malik and the Citric. The Malik and the Citric, I can feel the difference. Really interesting. Let's jump straight into the Acetic. Wow, there you go. Acetic acid, spreading it. Acetic is a more tart experience. And finally, Solberg and Hansen. Right, so now I'm thinking about all four. Which one jumped out the most? Strangely abstract. Now, like I said, the citric acid is sharp, but it's, it's just a kind of crisp, gentle one. And that to me is the, the sort of signature of mock. Mock are very gentle roasters. They love delicate flavor notes. So when I picked this coffee for citric acidity, I knew mock was not going to be a wild, crazy coffee with super lemony, extreme flavor. I knew it would be a gentle affair. And they don't disappoint. Once more, a brilliant coffee. Okay. Um, number three, number four, I've done them. <laughs> Sip it again. Wow, it's so, number three is so alive with tart, exaggerated mouthfeels, right? Um, the other three are very similar mouthfeel, very gentle, very clean. Acidity, okay. Acidity, that's the main thing. Focus on acidity now. Now, this is one really requires comparing. I cannot say if one is stronger than the other until I compare. I can't decide which has more acidity between one and two. What do you guys feel? They're very close to each other. I feel like number three is very strong acid. But number one and yeah, two? Yeah, me too. I find three really high. Mike, you said it's one and two because they're such different kinds of acid. It's really hard 
to get your head around which is more acidic. Just equal then. Just put equal. Yeah. yeah. In some ways, I mean, I guess it probably would go on the same personal taste, isn't it? Like, yeah. things probably feel a bit sharper to one person than another. That's very true. I mean, this is why they put the message out in the coffee world. Acidity is not a crime. Um, don't be afraid of the acids, all that sort of stuff, because it freaks a lot of people out. You go to the Mediterranean countries. I'm sure Ryan knows this in Israel. There are lots and lots of people in hot countries that just want very chocolatey, roasty, full coffee. And acids in coffee just freaks them out. And it represents the sort of antithesis of what they understand about coffee. So, so trying, trying to explain that to customers was always a challenge. Right. I think the, the best thing to do, in my opinion, is just to put the coffee in front of somebody and don't call it coffee. Give it a new name and then maybe they'll enjoy it more. <laughs> okay. I would say number three is the strongest acidity. Yep. Number four is so gentle. Number four super super gentle but understand that there is acidity there if you can't taste acid in a light roasted coffee for instance like Solberg and Hansen that just means you have gotten used to the levels of acidity in specialty coffee and this one presented low acid but it doesn't mean it's not there so that's something I really want to highlight with number four it's a great way to exemplify how important acid is without actually being able to obviously pick it up Without the acidity in number four, you'd actually have a very flat, boring coffee. So it, it's really interesting to see that acids often create a lot of depth without really making themselves known. Okay. Body. A tricky one. All right. This is a good way to do it, though. Right. I think number two has the most body. That's surprising as well. The others are quite similar. They're not gloopy coffees. We're having a, a, an interesting affair this month where um, each month I think you get different varieties in different sections. Like one month you have four coffees where each mouthfeel was completely different. Um, this And one month you have where bodies are all very different. This month it's uh, it's the acidity. It's the acidity that's the variety, and that's what we focused on. So I'm glad that's what's displaying different levels. Finally, the finish. So I'm going to drink a bit of water. Um, on the body, I, I kind of find that um, two and three have got the most, and then one, four, a little bit less. Yeah, agreed. I think three is exhibiting extreme forms of everything. Body, acidity, finish, the lot. Mouthfeel. It's and is it, yeah. It's a bit of an unfair advantage for a for a natural to get some some wash in terms of body. Yeah, I mean, this is it's not really about which one has more and is the winner. It's just you're right. It's the the having this natural is offsetting itself even more extreme. Very interesting though. I like that. Okay, um, finish for number one. Okay, that's a, a short, medium, short finish. Number two. Very similar finish, almost identical to number one. Here we go, number three. Oh, man. It's a very long finish, but I wouldn't put it right on the end. Experience has told me that there are coffees with such long finishes. And this one, number three, it's long, but it's not crazy long. Okay. Number four, longer than one and two. Even though number four is very clean, uh, I find it a slightly longer finish. Maybe it's umaminess, the brothiness I was talking about, but it's not as short, number four, as I thought it might be. Right, now the flavors. So hopefully you don't have the whole bags of coffee there. You see these whole bags up here. Some of our subscribers, they cheat. They have these bags and the flavors are on there. We don't Ryan, like that. <laughs> Ryan, has bags. Ryan, hide the bags. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> Try to come up with your own flavor notes, Ryan. 
we do know that the roasters often their notes it's hard to sort of get away from them once they're attached in your brain but set your minds free and see where it goes uh flavor wheel please okay coffee number one thank you so with the aid of the flavor wheel and just a bit of instinct and memory you know think about foods you've had start I always follow the basic rules of the flavor wheel, which is I start with the basic category. I'm tasting something like a fruit. I'm tasting something like a citrus fruit. I'm tasting an orange. I'm tasting a tinned orange. You can go all the way to the specific point, but it's best to start in that very basic five category thing in your mind. So, mm, see. Let's start from number one. Number one, here we go. Flavor notes, call them out, type them on the screen. I love to hear unusual flavor notes. I'm getting some rhubarb from number one. Rhubarb. That would probably be the tartness, right? Mixed yeah. with the sweetness. Yes. Something like rhubarb acidity, you could even say. Rhubarb is malic acid. Ah, well done. Yeah, there we go. So rhubarb is a malic acid. Ah. Congrats. Yep, rhubarb is there. But I think. Oh, no, I'm not going to say it. There's a flavor <laughs> note that the roaster has, and I'm tasting that. So I'm going to keep my mouth shut about that one. I'm actually getting almonds from number one. That was the first thing I thought was almonds. No, you know, it's, yeah. Now that you've said it, I can find that. So this is it, guys. Don't be afraid to call flavors out that the others will probably agree with, or you'll find yourself going, yeah, well, why didn't I taste that before? Well, it's just simply when somebody puts it in your head, then you can sort of see if you find it in your mind. And if you don't say that as well, say, I'm not getting that. It's just about learning what we, how different a coffee can be for each person, as well as the similarities. Okay. One more, one more flavor from me for number one. Hmm. It's tricky. Let's see. So I know it's a tart kind of fruit. It's maybe grape. It's a grape-like experience that I'm getting, but it doesn't taste of grape. So mm. that's the nearest sort of original flavor note I can come up with, apart from copying your flavors. <laughs> oh, great. I feel like it's got the same kind of uh, drying in your mouth kind of uh, feel that grapes give you. Yeah, yeah, right? Grape skin. Grape skin. There we go. Grape skin. Lovely. I think, I think that's why I thought almonds. Because I associate that kind of dryness in the mouth. Right. The well, this is it. You see, taste buds and the, the illusionary nature of coffee is that you can be tasting almonds, somebody says something else, and then, oh, yeah, it can be that as well. So very, we're on the border of all these different flavors, and it, it, our minds can push it one way or the other. So interesting. I get spice as well, actually. Spice. Nutmeg. Oh, I'm not getting that. Yeah. That's entirely Ico. <laughs> Natalie. Oh, Natalie as well, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I can, I can see there's something spicy. I haven't thought nutmeg, but I was thinking something spicy too. Yeah. Yes, agreed. The sp not nutmeg, but but that spicy element is very much there. And the juiciness of um, grapes kind of thing, mm -hmm. in mouth feel, and they kind of associate with flavors right. as well. And the dry mouth feel, I would say, because this is a honey processed coffee, and we had a honey addition, and we had so many honey coffees from Costa Rica that I think that the dryness is a Honduras thing more than the process. So that's an interesting thing that Honduras have with these leathery, deep, complex tastes. Um, right, two? number two. Sip of water. Wow. I get... Cake, something like cake with number two. Lemon cake, lemon drizzle. Is that? I'm gonna say like baked pears. But... Baked pears. Well, ironically, the pear flavor comes with number one, uh, <laughs> according to the roaster. But yeah, I know what you mean. It's a sort of, it's a soft what fruit. About, Sorry. Bit 
Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah, the poppy seed is that sort of savory in this. Is -ness. Yeah, that's a good one. Great. So that's an interesting way to identify things. See, if the roaster had put that down, lemon, cake, and poppy seed, that would have been such an exotic, interesting thing to be able to pick up. So um, detailed flavor notes like that, I find very exciting. And a great way to sell a coffee, because uh, like um, Manhattan coffee roasters, I love their flavor notes. I'll read to you one of them. Here we go. So Diero Garcia has ripe peach, pink blossom, strawberry frutella. So this is a very specific flavor note that he's connected with from his childhood maybe, but that's the way to do it. I love it. I do get gummy bear kind of feel from number two. Excellent, gummy bears. Yeah, anyone else getting that kind of kid? Yeah, I was thinking like wine gums. You know how wine gums have that kind of... Agreed, more wine gums. Sorry, Aiko. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Natalie nailed okay. it. You haven't eaten wine gums, though, I think. No, I haven't. It's a very English thing, maybe. Or Ryan, it's in Israel as well. Okay. Ah. Wow. Well, amazing. Okay. South Africa as well. I don't know if it's so much candy, but uh, definitely South Africa. Right. Maybe one day you'll identify a flavor note. Peppermint crunch. That's a, that's yeah. a South African... Delicacy. <laughs> what citric acid? Yeah, what's the citric acid are you picking up now? Uh, is it still there? Because the coffee has gotten colder. I know I was definitely tasting the beautiful, delicate lemon acidity at the beginning. Are we still getting it now, though? Mm, definitely. Yeah. 100%. Very much so. But so gentle. I mean, these guys mock world class, aren't they? Everything they do, delicate. Gentle, complex. I love their coffees. So is it lemon? It's it's sort of yeah. That's definitely a lemon acidity. Citric lemon, but but rounded, not spiky. Yeah, like a really like when you get a really proper ripe lemon. Right. So it has that sweetness as well as the the acidity. Agreed. Sweet ripe lemon. Perfect. Number three. A sip of water. Okay. Woo! This thing gets wilder as it cools. Flavor notes. Difficult one, right? Because the, uh, the acetic nature of this coffee is so present. So when we talk about acidity in coffee providing complexity, providing sweetness, in this coffee I would say it's really taking over. It's really kind of the driving force of this coffee. You're going to remember the, the acidity of this coffee more than the flavor, I think, even. Bit, bit tricky to kind of identify the flavor notes now. I know when brewing the coffee, it doesn't present this much of the acidity. But right now, I feel like it's 80% of the coffee is the acidity. Can I throw a curveball in there? Please do. I actually get a bit of umami in it. It reminds me a bit of, um, you know, like dark miso. Hmm. I, Michael, dark miso <laughs> specialist. <laughs> Not a white oh. miso, but that kind of roast. Ryan, what are you getting? Bubble gum. Bubble gum. Ooh. Oh my God, you're right. I don't know if you guys have had bazooka bubble gum. I have. Yeah. I'm getting it. I can't believe that. You see, this is what I love about cuppings, especially with groups, is that someone says something and if you get it, you get it. And I do. I can't believe that it buried in this strange coffee is the flavor of bubble gum. It's there, you're right, you're right. I can't get over that, that's so exciting. Brilliant, brilliant flavor identified there, amazing. So if you're watching this on YouTube and you now have listened to Ryan pick up bubble gum flavor, are you guys getting it as well? Leave a comment. Tell us if you picked up that incredible, unusual flavor note in coffee number three, abstract, bubble gum. What else? I want to pick up something as interesting as that as well. What about papaya? Definitely papaya, right? Mm -hmm. 
a tropical kind of spicy fruit type thing. Mm. I haven't no, actually peppery. eaten too much. Pe peppery fruit, yeah? Mm. Peppery fruit. I think it's quite it's floral. It's well. higher and you get a bit of papaya seed. It's on the edge of tropical, <laughs> but it's not quite tropical, right? It's on the yeah, edge of... Right. Yeah. Okay. Finally, reset. But I love that number three, though. Yeah. I really love it. It's terrific. It's got a kind of apple cider vinegar thing going on, which I guess is the acid. Yep. I love apple cider vinegar. So for me, that's a real positive. Oh, that's so cool. And I actually drank apple cider vinegar for our acid taste test challenge. That was pH, what, 2.9 or something? Nine, yeah. yeah, that was pretty extreme. So I drink it every day. <laughs> it's good for you, yeah. It's really good. <laughs> Don't drink too much of it. On the morning, I definitely got that vinegar kind of. Uh, I don't really drink naturals, and I was like, "What? Well, where's that? Where's that flavor that I'm tasting?" And I was like, "Wow, it's like vinegar." But have you managed to get? Have you followed the recipe, Ryan, with abstract? Have you gotten the really like great coffee out of it? Um, I don't know the V60. Uh, I think they recommend V60. I, I brewed it on the Aurea. Um, just using one of the recommended uh, recipes. Um, what grind setting? On my Easy Presso, it was a seven, which is kind of like medium. I think it's uh, like 27 clicks on the Commandante, something like that. Pretty I cool. would recommend going coarser. The Aurea is a very fast brewer. And I think for this coffee, for abstract, it might be too fast. A, gr a fine grind, fast extraction, I'm worried, would be just too, too pungent. Do you mean the first coffee that's finished on the recommended time, two minutes 30, like on the dot. Um, so, but honestly, it tasted pretty good. Um, right. So I'll definitely try, try uh, course a little bit. Um, but I, I only have a, a Kalita and an Oreo to play with, um, oh. and an Aeropress. But, um, what, that's all you need. What did you say you ground on, Ryan? We did 27 for the abstract. Yeah, he did the same, about 27 clicks. Oh, well, on what brewer though? A, a easy presso, um, and I kind of use a rough estimation between the Commandante and the Easy Presso. So I think it, you know, on this, it's, I think it uh, relates to about seven out of nine or so uh, grind settings. Seven um, out of nine, meaning quite fine? Is nine the finest? No, no, nine is the fourth. Oh, great. Okay, well, then you're doing it right. Absolutely. I, I, I mean, there is no wrong, but. Yeah, you could go closer than nine. I'm not sure what the usable range is, but uh, got the the wow uh, brand adjustments on that from the outside. So. Big numbers. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, that's all I was going to say. Is that I think a bit coarser would be better for this coffee. So you're doing it right. Okay, uh, coffee number four. Let's get some interesting flavors. Um, biscuits. I'm getting bovril. What is that? Bovril, here we go. The beef broth. <laughs> we don't want to scare people. She means it in a good way. <laughs> yeah. This also kind of reminds me of like a, like a mulled fruit kind of, um, like a berry, you know, kind of dark berry flavors. Yeah. Mul Not fermented, but. Um, is it a bit like, um, a bit like blue vine? You know, like, um, in that in that kind of territory, yeah. Yeah. What did Not you say? Crazy, but that kind of same. Yeah. Oh. When I made it yesterday, my my first impression was like, wow, this is very fruity. Um, I just feel like the, there's something about the taste when I'm drinking it. It's I almost want to eat it. It's got this kind of because of the brothy beefiness, because of the lovely, delicious sweetness and the mouthfeel. It just almost feel like I'm biting it, not drinking it. Very unusual sensation. You know, like um, like really lovely ripe dark cherries. Oh wow! Is that what you're getting? Yeah, definitely. That's like um. That's in there, but to me, I associate dark cherries as a more rich flavour. Interesting. Am I not associating dark cherries in the right way? Well, I'm thinking about like you know, like if you stop at a roadside place and buy them, so I don't mean like syrupy. Ah. So, so still definitely a fruit, but a very dark 
<laughs> I see what you mean now. Yes, yes. What else are they getting? Uh, that frothiness is coming out a lot more in, the, in this method of the cupping than, than uh, brewing it through a filter. And light it with a filter. Um, it's quite interesting. What about the acidity? Compare this with, for instance, uh, number two, because these are in a similar family. You've got the citric acid. Compare that here. And is there a comparison? That's it. I'm getting done. more malic acid from number four. I bring number four. Interesting. Iko says she's picking up the malic acid, because like I said, all these acids are present in all the coffees often. It's just that there's one that's stronger than the rest. No. Yeah, it's number two. Like the, the sweet lemon was really there. And this, I don't get anything like lemon. There's fruit, but it's nothing like a citrus fruit to me. Yeah. So what would you describe the acidity? How would, not labeling it, but just the, 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 the feeling? It's kind of smooth. Yes. Yeah, and that I think highlights my point about acidity bringing complexity and something to a coffee that you you might not know is being provided by the acidity. So it's there. If you were to take it away, you'd feel like the coffee hasn't got any structure, but you're just not able to identify it when it is there. A great example of that. So um, I think we've really got a great set here that shows you not just types of acidity, but strength of acidity um, and their role basically in providing sweetness, complexity, or just backing up other flavors in a coffee. It does so much. Number four, it's making me think a little bit like um, like a marmalade or a jam, because it's, you know, it's got that, that kind of, um, the acid there, but it's softened off in the way that it is when it's preserved, you know? You're right. Spread it on your toast. <laughs> Yeah, it's really got that jam-like quality. You're right. Oh, that's what it is. Okay, Natalie has nailed number four now. Just like Ryan earlier's great flavor identification, I think jam, sort of like a jam-like feeling is number four. Wow. And I am tempted to just like pour some on a, on a scone or something now. <laughs> Brilliant. What a great session, guys. Really, really cool. Um, acid edition has been fantastic. Thank you again. Um, we should uh, do the, like, you know, answers, not answers, roasters profiles. Ah, yes. Now I've got to reveal the roasters profiles. So coffee number one, here we go. The flavor notes for coffee number one, pear, lemon, caramel. Sorry, Ryan, no surprises for you because you have the whole bag. <laughs> <laughs> I just put the bag wrong. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, uh, sorry, Natalie? Pear, lemon, caramel. Are you surprised by that? I am. I don't pick caramel at all. No, I mm. think to brew it, you'll pick up the caramel okay. more. But the pear is interesting, right? Pear, yeah. yeah. Very much. I can't go away from brew one, but, you know, I can, see the, I can see where pear comes from. I totally agree. That's what I said when I tasted it. I can see that this pear, from your point of view, but I'm getting something slightly different. Yeah, I think great was kind of, kind of, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like grape, and probably the roaster was thinking, if I put grape, everyone will think that's boring because there's a lot of coffees with grape, so yeah. it's always good to switch up. Okay, Mock. I, I don't know what rhubarb tastes like, so I, I can't really uh, relate, but I can kind of get the pear. Yeah, and Ryan has, has highlighted another key thing we like to tell people, which is eat lots of foods, because that will then help you when tasting coffee. I'm, oh. I'm, I'm worried that Ryan <laughs> Do they have right, a rhubarb? Yeah. Israel fruit selection is going to be very different. <laughs> Rwanda, karambi. Lime, we know about. Kiwi and cacao nibs. Cacao nibs, really? I'm surprised by that. So what we were saying as lemon, they described as lime. lime. Yes, we were saying lemon. They say lime. So I would agree with that because it was such a gentle lemon. And that basically is what lime acidity is, a less, uh, pun a less sharp acidity than lemon. You sort of go, I think, on the, acidity, on the citric acid scale, I would say from soft 
to strongest or to the lightest uh, would be mandarin. Mandarin orange taste would be the kind of uh, lowest citric acid experience. And then you would go lemon or orange, mandarin, then orange, then lemon, then uh, bergamot, maybe. That sort of sits even more citric, but less taste of lemon. So those sort of things can be interchanged. And pear, I mean, sorry, lime sits at that gentle acid compared to lemon. Don't get kiwi at all. I'm not getting kiwi, but that's again in the cupping. But I am getting cacao nibs now that they've mentioned it. So yeah, my brain is going there. Interesting. And um, number three. Yeah, because we were talking earlier about, um, I mean, we said wine bottles, didn't we? And I, I can see the cacao nibs now too. It's yeah. Like it's that love that when a true and uh, cacao is a hard one I find because chocolate cacao nibs all these they're very similar and he said cacao nibs but I might have said chocolate milk chocolate I don't know so he's the expert. It's Sorry, I mean dark chocolate. Yes. For lack of a better word, just like roastiness. True. Um, it's like a, a, a dry chocolate. When it's dark chocolate, it doesn't yeah, have that yeah. smooth. Like yeah. High percentage dark chocolate. Agreed. Agreed. Number three. Number three. Okay. Uh, Car uh, Carlos Alfredo, carbonic macerated, Honduras. Two flavor notes only. Tropical fruit salad. What? <laughs> and black currant. Which is, you know, it's his right to do this because he tasted it, he roasted it, and that's what he got. But sometimes I just completely disagree with a roaster. <laughs> and I would definitely not put tropical fruit salad myself. The experience is still great. I'm not disagreeing with someone about their flavor profiles. In no way detracts from the experience. I just find it interesting sometimes, the flavors that roasters come up with compared to what I'm tasting. Do you guys get the tropical fruit salad at all? I, I kind of do. Um, so I, it could just be the kind of fruit salad my mom would make. So. I mean, I said that it was on the edge of tropical, but I never felt like it really was a celebration of tropical flavors. It felt to me more like it was sort of on the edge, but more something more exciting and different than just simply sweet tropical whatever. It reminds me a bit now that we're talking about it, I'm thinking about star fruit. Ooh. You know how star fruit has that edge of tropical but not that sweet kind well, of flavour? I've never eaten star fruit, so oh. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> that's that's the see the essence is that someone else picks up star fruit. I have no relationship to that, so I'll never be able to put that down. Okay. Uh, number four, finally. Solberg and Hansen, Columbia, El Abrage. And just a quick note to tell you that um, uh, it's really interesting that El Abrage this month, we were able to taste two other El Abrages, a Geisha and Tangua Natural. And they're all very similar. And that to me was an interesting experience. I love Solberg and Hansen because they do not just one coffee, but three from one farm and 28 different coffees on their website. So very exciting. Now this one, it was actually the best of all three. I love the Geisha, but it didn't really deliver that yummy kind of, I could eat the coffee experience. The washed was the best. And their flavor notes are, oh yeah, I've got to translate the Norwegian. <laughs> Here we go. And right, it says full bodied and juicy, volcanic soil combined. Where are the flavor notes? There's no flavor notes there. I'll have to do it again. Okay. Where are the flavor nuts? Are they on here? We don't have any flavor notes, guys. Oh. That's it. No flavor notes on the bag. Solberg and Hansen, honestly. Can we go, can we find it on the website maybe? Try. I really want to know what they think. Now I'm also going to say, I, I'm going to post a detailed brew guide to this coffee as well. I forgot to post that but they gave me this really great breakdown of how to get the very best out of this coffee, TDS wise. So Ryan, if you have a TDS reader or if any of you guys out there watching want to get more, the best brew out of this, 
I will post the sort of statistical information that Gabe from Solvo and Hanson provided me. A really, really great, useful guide that was. So that's it. That is the end of the Acid Edition. We have actually got one more bonus event, and that's for coffee number one, which was this month's replacement coffee. As you know, we couldn't go with Manhattan. They didn't, it didn't arrive in time. So we went with 15 grams instead. And uh, we've got to talk to this roaster and get a brew guide from him next week. Meet the roaster. Is it next week or this week? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. There you go. <laughs> I'm so stupid. Okay. It's tomorrow we'll be meeting um, Joe. So we have two Joes this month, two English roasters called Joe, both with a Honduras coffee. How entertaining is that? So the second Joe with a Honduras coffee tomorrow. And he's a really cool guy. Uh, we also found out that both Joes are into Bauhaus. So it's really interesting how much parallels there are between these two guys. Uh, Unfortunately, there's no El Brage available anymore. There's no El Brage available, so no longer on the website. The flavor notes that you guys come up with are now the official flavor notes for El Brage. <laughs> <laughs> well done, guys. Uh, thanks for today. Join us again for another amazing cupping. Uh, favorite, one? favorite one? Yeah, let's hold up our favorite one. Sorry, you're right, Iko. It's our tradition here. So um, I won't do it. Just let you two decide what your favorite coffee is. So when you're ready. Oh, I'm really tall. <laughs> <laughs> you can hold two up at once if you want. Wow. I, I haven't brewed the uh, number one yet. Like, uh, oh, proper brew. Yeah, but so far it's... Today's... Boom, look at that. Three and two and two and four. So overall, I would say two seems to be the one that's uh, impressing. But that was just two people voting. So um, we'll take that as a, as a minor mini uh, endorsement. So well done. Fantastic, that, guys. Uh, next month, we're doing new kids. We've got four new roasters uh, who all launched in the last sort of six to nine months. It's very exciting. One roaster actually hasn't even launched. And we've got his coffee arriving. This is a very exclusive thing. These guys are so passionate and so amazing. They almost picked the coffees between them for us. They all sort of know each other and they knew what we do. So they were so excited to give us uh, on their launch an amazing coffee. So really next month you're getting super premium coffees from four roasters who want to show off what they got. And so I can't wait for that. And we're also going to have like this Google Meet, I'm going to invite all four roasters to talk with me on a Google Meet and then we'll post that on YouTube. So it'll be a great conversation the four roasters will have about what it takes to start a roastery this year, um, their experiences of working for other roasters and what they wanna to bring to the world of specialty coffee. So join us next month, subscribe if you wanna taste the future of specialty coffee in next month's edition. And then July, it's gonna be, I'm oh, sorry, June is gonna be a champion's edition. Three of the champions we've got are world champions. So it's going to be an epic edition. And uh, yeah, I can't announce who the roasters are yet, but just join the coffee club if you want this crazy adventure every month. That's it, guys. Thanks for joining me. Oh, thank you, Natalie. Cheers, Ryan. Actually, uh, part of my celebrations is I'll be going to Israel at the end of the month. So I'll see you, Ryan, in Israel. And uh, yeah, thank you so much, guys, for joining. See you soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. See you, Ryan. <laughs>